Traditions can be important to sustain stories, but they can become an impediment to knowing you. Help us not allow anything get in the way of knowing Jesus. Amen. Well, we sure he said so well with that little video clip, 13 seconds by the way, from Fiddler on the Roof. And today we're track track. My cool bud. Today we're tackling tradition. I think there are three things which get in the way of a close relationship with Jesus that make up tradition. I think the first one is rigidness. When people are so inflexible that they will not bend one way or another, it has to be this way, as the Pharisees rejected. The second way is minutia. The small little things that just consume a person without being able to see the larger picture that is there. And people get just consumed by the little things in life that really don't matter. And finally, the third thing that I think really contributes to this story is the sense of being so closed-minded you can't see the forest for the trees. All three of those, in my opinion, contribute to tradition, and I believe all three are found in the story of Matthew. There's a Presbyterian church in South Carolina. The church is a little larger than Laley. It's a, a big old stone building that goes back probably several hundred years. And like Laley has a sign out front that you can put the times of service, the things that are happening. Uh, you can change it if you want to. And if we change the times of services, we can change it on the marquee. Jay and Cindy do a great job of keeping that up to date. But this church, in South Carolina, their sign is a stone block engraved worship at 10 a.m. God help the pastor who proposes a change in time at that church. Religious beliefs can come across as being set in stone. Right, rigidness, inflexibility, they get in the way of a closer walk with Jesus. We need we can change to accommodate the needs of individuals. It's like the old saying, Jews don't recognize Jesus as Messiah. Protestants don't recognize the Pope as head of the church. And Presbyterians don't recognize each other in the liquor store. That's what happens. Some <laughs> traditions can be very helpful for us. And we need to be a bit careful when stating that Jesus gets mad at tradition, because tradition keeps alive some great stories that are just part of who we are. We don't want to forget them. We want to remember them and keep them in the context. So let me ask you, let me just take a quick poll. How many of you would be a bit perturbed that if you came here on Christmas Eve, and we did begin the Christmas Eve service with, Oh, come all ye faithful, or end with Silent Night, Holy Night. <laughs> exactly. There are more hands that want to go up, but you're just afraid. I know that. <laughs> and how many of you would be a bit troubled if Easter Sunday didn't begin with, Christ the Lord is risen to the dead? There are some things that we just expect that are part of who we are and the stories we tell we repeat over and over again. There are some traditions that are honored and appreciated for the lessons and stories that they convey. I remember this, and this is maybe part of the sermon. When I was a kid going to Thanksgiving dinner, my great aunt would show up. And Aunt Emmy, God rest her soul, she would tell the same jokes every Thanksgiving. And my aunt Augie would say the same story at every Thanksgiving. And my grandmother would say the same thing every Thanksgiving. It was part of keeping a story, a family alive. Dean Reynolds is a pastor in Texas, but he's from Marietta, Georgia. And there on the Kennesaw Mountain, where the Kennesaw Mountain battlefield is, it was took place in the Civil War. And he tells a story about the reenactors that, you know, participate in the reenactment of this, uh, of this story that takes place. The group, it's mostly men, although there are some women as well, they reenact these battles all the time. They have authentic uniforms and equipment. There's lots of people who show up for this. They're organized in the proper formations, regiments, companies. In the end, 
We know how the story ends. We know. But they were enacted every year. The victor must be victorious. The vanquished must lose. They tell the story to show what had happened. And we need to learn from those lessons of the past. Christian faith is like that. We reenact the ancient battles from the world. The lessons are already set. We, the grown-ups, we always know the outcome. We know the story of Christianity. We reenact it every single year. From Advent through Easter, the stories. We've heard the birth of Jesus how many years for as long as we've been alive. We've heard the story of Jesus being betrayed as long as we've been alive. We've heard about him being crucified and then risen to the dead as long as we have been alive. Why do we do that? Because it's a story of our salvation. A story of hope. A story of redemption that is just part of who we are. When you get to the story of Matthew and Matthew 15, if you look at it, read it several times, verses 1 through 20, you know, I, I, I kind of think Jesus is being set up. You know, he's engaged with these very rigid Pharisees who focus on minutia. They just don't want to waver. They're looking ways to trap him, and they are so, their lives are so black and white. So Jesus at this time is in a town called Gennesaret. Previously in Matthew 14, he, he, he was walking on water, and finally he guesses the shore where Gennesaret is. The people have heard about him, and they're flocking to him. They want to touch the fringe of his garment just so that they can be healed. They gather and follow, and that probably contributes to the jealousy and concern of the religious leaders who are calling the shots. They see this young rebel, this upstart, making waves, making problems for them, upsetting tradition. And so they're a big concern about this. And so, word spread quicker than a church rumor that Jesus was there. And word must have reached Jerusalem because the Pharisees and scribes, they, they took a field trip from Jerusalem to Gennesaret. Now, Gennesaret is about 65 miles from Jerusalem. It's like going up to RSW and back again, 60 some, 60 some miles. And so, there's no public transportation, there's no metro, there's no bus, there's no trolley, there's no Uber, no lift, a couple donkeys maybe, that's about it. And when they met Jesus, they had more questions for him than a Jesus pretzel. <laughs> and that worked so hard on that line, I really didn't know what that <laughs> And so the Pharisees were concerned about keeping tradition for the sake of keeping tradition. But really, to preserve their job. They had no open mind to consider anything different. So I would say, why, why do your disciples break tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before you. So the Pharisees are referring to Exodus 30. These are, these are guidelines of temple etiquette. And what the Pharisees did, they took these, these guidelines for temple etiquette and applied it to all of life, which was a bit unfair. They attempted to apply this etiquette and therefore call people out, setting people up for failure. Now, in their world, their world was black. So Jesus throws a spotlight on the terrors of their tradition. He addresses their closed-mindedness to faith and to a living God who is alive and present and around them. And in speaking about honoring father and mother, Jesus turns the tables on them. We all need men, honor your father and mother. But you i.e. the Pharisees, they say, the support you might have had from me is now given to God. And oh, by the way, because it's given to God, I get a cut from it since I'm in this group. You got to let other minds think, right? Kind of, kind of like. Their practice and tradition perverted the honoring of fathers and mothers. So it'd be like this. It'd be like me saying to my mom, in assisted living up in E-Town, Pennsylvania. Mom, I'm going to honor you so much. I'm going to take the money the family is paying for your care and give it to my church. And by the way, I'm going to get a cut of that as well. That's what they're saying. Something perverted about that rationale. It's just not right. There's no honor there. 
There's no honoring father or mother in that equation. And to that, Jesus says, for the sake of your tradition, you nullify the word of God. Talk is cheap. I actually saw a sign that read, anybody who thinks talk is cheap to talk to a lawyer. <laughs> so you can say anything in your heart is not in it. Well, and then your heart is far from God, and in vain do we worship God. So the setup thus far is the Pharisees, they leave Jerusalem, they go to Gennesaret. They travel, they meet Jesus. Jesus and the Pharisees, they, they have a side conversation, and Jesus concludes the conversation by saying, as we're going to build a friendship, you hypocrites, what a great ending to the conversation. And then the scene changes. Jesus, with the Pharisees and scribes over here, he calls the crowd to him, and he says, listen and understand, it's not what goes into a mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of a mouth that defiles a person. And Jesus keeps talking to the crowd, and he speaks, and as he speaks, the disciples walk over to him, they pull him aside, and they say the following, uh, uh, you know, I think you're really picked off the Pharisees, what you're saying, maybe I'll be quiet about it. They're offended. Reminds me of I was in the Northern Virginia in uniform. I would be asked to say a prayer at a at an event. And so I I wrote my prayer, I said my prayer, and I sat down. And the person sitting next to me said, uh, Chaplain, I don't think the commander liked your prayer. And I said, Well, I wasn't talking to him. <laughs> Jesus tells about parable about blind guys. Every plant that my father did not plant will be uprooted. The blind are leading the blind. And Peter, always with a question, asks for an explanation. And I guess a, a paraphrase of Jesus' response was, you still don't get it, do you? It's not what goes into your mouth. Food process, disposed by body functions, no. What really matters is what comes out of your mouth. Or proceed from the heart. Whether you're washing hands or don't doesn't matter. It's what's in your heart. Tradition that keeps one away from God. A young rabbi found a serious problem in his new congregation. During the Friday service, half the congregation stood for prayers and half remained seated. Each side shouted at each other, insisting that theirs was the true tradition. Nothing the rabbi said or did moved for solving the impasse. And finally, in desperation, the young rabbi sought out the synagogue's 99-year-old founder. He met the old rabbi in a nursing home and poured out his troubles about what was happening in the congregation he served. So tell me, he pleaded. Was it the tradition for the congregation to stand during the prayer? No, answered the old rabbi. Ah, responded the younger man. Then it was the tradition to sit during the prayer. No, answered the rabbi. Well, the young rabbi answered, what we have is complete chaos. Half the people stand and shout, and the other half sit and scream. Ah, said the old man. That was the tradition. <laughs> You know, Jesus wants us to connect with God. And Jesus gets mad when instead of helping, traditions end up making it harder for people to connect. Most of us tend to default to rules and traditions. You know, churches have so many rules and traditions. The more rules we have, the easier it is to have a bit more control over people and situations. And sometimes when those rules become inflexible and rigid, Turn people off. Faith, church, the life that Jesus offers. Jesus calls us to be better than this. So in the end, I think churches confuse tradition with truth, rhetoric with reality, and practice with presence. And I know, and I have heard, that some of the most recently introduced songs are not exactly a hit with many. That's okay. I can take it. Well, kind of. I can take it. Change is never easy. But no one is terribly bad. Tradition can be an impediment to having a closer walk with Jesus. 
How many of you saw the 1984 movie Footloose starring Kevin Bacon and John Lithgow? Oh. <laughs> well, it's a story about a, a town that outlawed dancing. And the backstory is that a, a young adult died in a car accident under the influence of alcohol returning from a dance. Reverend Shaw, played by John Lithgow, Persuade the town council to enact anti liquor, anti drug, and anti dance. Bacon, who played the role of Ren, the Chicago native, and his mom moved to a small town and he worked to change the law, making the following plea before the town council. Well, I just, I, I just wanted to say a few words about this motion. Aren't we told? In, in Psalm 149, praise you, the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Let them praise his name in the dance. Amen. Amen. It was King David. King David, who, who we read about in, in Samuel. And, and, and what did David do? What did David do? What did David do? David <laughs> danced before the Lord with all his might, leaping, leaping and dancing before the Lord, leaping and dancing. And Ecclesiastes assures us. There is a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to laugh. A time to weep. A time to mourn. And there is a time to dance. There was a time for this law, not anymore. See, this is our time to dance. We can make the Bible say anything we want it to say. We need to be open to what God is saying to us to read Holy Scripture. Tradition can get in the way of a closer walk with Jesus. Jesus got made a tradition that tripped people up over their relationship with the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of life. Rigidness, minutia, closed mindedness can starve a hungry spirit for a living God. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out. And may that love of God be etched on the stone outside of everything. Amen.